Okay, the main thing today is to get the electromagnetism married to classical mechanics and to do it in a way that actually is relativistically invariant. It's talking with light and light pays relativity. But that isn't obvious at, at first. Well, before we go there, though, uh, there's some more cycloid geometry that I think you should see. And it, it is really a sophomore physics problem to hit a stick, have a lever rotate. We've been talking about uh, the trebuchet with its two levers uh, and then making connection with um, the humans swinging uh, various kinds of levers to build the culture and now to uh, to recreation. So I thought you ought to see this. This is uh, a neat way to look at that uh, uh, situation. So we will take care of that first. And, and while we're at it, um, those of you that play another game that's played around here a lot, and that's a... Um, eight ball or just plain old billiards, uh, there's some interesting physics that goes into that as well, which you may have already seen, but it's a good thing to see it again. In any case, most of our work today is involved in electromagnetic fields and the mechanics that occurs in the in a crossed E and B field. And that is um, Hall effect. And there's a lot of stuff in this building that involves uh, effects that are connected to the Hall effect in solids. And two-dimensional lattices and the sort of thing that uh, I think maybe a lot of you will be doing research on if you stick around here. So um, at the end of that, I definitely want to show you this machine that's uh, sitting in the, has been sitting in the classroom all along. I've got it worn, cleaned up and ready to go, I think. This is a mechanical analog for a cyclotron resonance. That is, it's a mechanical analog for uh, cycloids that occur uh, in the trajectories uh, inside an electric and a magnetic field that are crossed. So uh, that is um, the topic for uh, main topic for today. Uh, it comes at the end, but let's take a look at this uh, part right here uh, before we uh, get to that, and that is the hitting of a stick. And um, basic idea is very simple, and it's kind of worth remembering it's something that uh, happens you hit the stick somewhere on it it's pretty obvious what would happen if you hit it right at the center of gravity it would just take off and be like a, a, a one particle problem but this is a um, well basically infinite number of particles but the inertia this only thing has, has one inertia and that's this inertia right here and we're measuring a, a, a linear density with a letter rho uh, usually that's uh, reserved for volume density, but here it's linear density. So the mass of this thing is just the linear density uh, times its total length. And uh, we're measuring uh, here uh, the, um, the uh, uh, inertia, or we're producing it by taking an integral. And so uh, we get uh, that expression right there, uh, inertia, ml squared over 3. But the thing that's interesting is when you hit this stick uh, anywhere except the, the dead center, uh, you give it both angular momentum and linear momentum. So we we'll use the uh, uppercase a pi to represent p uh, momentum uh, that we've been talking about throughout the beginning of this course. And then L is usually reserved for angular momentum. I'm just using Greek letters here. Uh, the lambda uh, is the uh, angular momentum. And it's pretty obvious that uh, the amount of angular momentum you've given there is the uh, distance up to that point there. Uh, <coughs> uh, that is the, the uh, lambda is h times the linear momentum that you Im implied with that bang uh, right there. So these two uh, quantities uh, are going to be conserved uh, as this thing goes through. And there's no gravity here, uh, but if there was, you could get in that frame and see basically what we're seeing here, and that's a cycloid, in this case a cycloid that moves in a straight line. So that, that's the, uh, the basic thing that the next few slides uh, will analyze, and, um, and this, of, of course, is an interesting, um, I mean, the way to look at this, I think, is, is as a, uh, uh, when you hit that uh, stick, you make an imaginary wheel, and um, the that uh, 
radius, sometimes called the radius of gyration, uh, or center of percussion, percussion is the letter P, that's why I'm using Greek for the uh, momentum here. Uh, the uh, basic idea is then this thing starts to roll like a, 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 a wheel on the road. And what's interesting also is that if you uh, hit the stick right at that particular point, the center percussion is a point that at first does not move at all. And so uh, it's taking a baseball bat or a tennis racket or something like that, if you hit the sweet spot, as they say, uh, you could be holding on to the tennis racket with your two fingers, and it would not at first move. You, you would be able to hold on to it, no matter how fast the ball came. And uh, that's because this, it's this point right here that point on the cycloid that has infinite curvature that we talked about uh, before. Uh, so the cycloid that this thing is making uh, here, and uh, you can see also some of that geometry that we talked about with respect to the um, Huygens uh, pendulum is being reproduced by the actual lever as a tangent uh, to each point on the cycloid. So it's, you know, that's kind of a beautiful motion, and I'm asking you to do a problem uh, that's basically the same as what we're doing right here. So with these two equations, we can then solve for the uh, momentum uh, of the two kinds of momentum. And the, uh, as I say, the important point is that uh, that that point right there doesn't move. Uh, in fact, second order motion occurs, uh, 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 but not first order. Everywhere else, you're either getting kicked this way or that way if you are holding on to the stick. Now, um, the, the, uh, the idea, where, where, when you're talking about the, um, this one point center question, where the speed of P omega due to the rotation has just canceled the translational speed. Uh, that, that, that is the speed of the center of this, the speed that uh, gives this quantity uh, the linear momentum. So that, that kind of sums it up. That's basically the whole uh, uh, geometry of this thing. And th th that gives this equation right here, that this velocity is related by um, those four uh, relations. And once you have that, then you can solve for the, uh, for the percussion uh, as a function uh, of the uh, height that you have chosen uh, to hit that uh, stick, to chosen to enter it, its momentum, so to speak. So this is the, uh, the, the uh, distance p, the percussion distance, the radius of this circle uh, right there. Uh, kind of neat. Anyway, once you get all that put together, what I said before is that you uh, have a uh, imaginary wheel that rolls and uh, makes um, cycloids out of every point on the stick, but only, only, uh, and I believe it is, uh, if I can uh, see it here, the, the points that actually make this cycloid, the uh, thing, are, are not colored, uh, but um, <coughs> the uh, the stick has a, a, a yellow point there, a red point there, a green point there. Uh, we're following those. Uh, this uh, curve right here is what's called a curly cycloid. And then uh, this curve, this dot right here follows what's called a prolate cycloid. That is a cycloid that isn't too different from a sine curve. It just gets a, uh, uh, finally becomes the actual cycloid that you can see here with the red dots, this one. The cycloid goes all the way uh, to this point. But in the, on the way there, you get two cycloids made by tangents, uh, sort of as a uh, bonus uh, of, of the geometry. Um, okay, so that, that I think is, is something worth knowing, worth thinking about, worth realizing. Because it's exactly what we're going to see in the orbits of a charged particle in a, a uniform magnetic field with an electric field turned on. And a surprising, you'll find some surprising things about that. 
uh, as we uh, go through this. Okay, um, just want to make sure all of that is understood and um, go through. Uh, we're going to use all three screens, or at least three of the screens today. Uh, this is where uh, this physics is applied uh, in the local uh, rec centers around on Dixon Street. Uh, they all have pool tables, uh, most of the beer halls. And the idea is here, how do you make um, a bumper on a pool table uh, at, at a height so the ball does not skid? when it hits. That is, uh, you make the game so that you have more, the ball comes up and comes back uh, without uh, skidding there. Now, if the ball already has rotation, it's a whole different problem. If you put English on the thing, uh, it's different. But the, if you have it, if it's actually rolling without sliding, uh, then uh, you've got this problem uh, all over again. Except it's not a stick now, it's an entire ball. The inertia formula for that one it's different, but uh, we can use the same formulas that we derived for the stick uh, to figure out where it would be. So, if you made the height just, if you, if you had, if the ball was such that it's uh, a, a percussion uh, circle, the circle that's going to roll, uh, make cycloids, uh, was higher uh, than the table point, the contact point, uh, then this, this, uh, when it hit there, it would skid, this point right here would skid and waste energy a little bit. Um, and and uh, that, that, you know, uh, English, I guess, or whoever it was that built pool tables first realized uh, sort of early on that you could make the height of a bumper in such a way that it reflected nicely. Billiards, three, three ball billiards, I think, is, uh, is an English uh, invention. And... Um, requires incredible skill uh, doing just dealing with three balls and you well I won't describe the rules for it but it's super big tables right and uh, that's true uh, you, you don't want to waste your energy uh, uh, for that to do a complicated thing so with the uh, ball skidding to the right uh, that um, is not desirable and having the uh, circle be too big Okay, that is, make it like that, uh, it's going to skid the other way. Okay, it skids to the left. And the question is, what H gets you right there? And the idea is to make the uh, circle of, of percussion, radius of the uh, percussion same, exactly equal to the radius of the ball. Okay. Now this is, rather than designing the center of percussion for the ball, we're trying to fit it to a certain height. Actually, we want to find out what that height is. We want to find out where the height is that makes this situation in which it's uh, here's your center of percussion right at the contact point. Okay, so that's kind of neat. You just go ahead and use the same formula as, as this, only this time you've got to use the inertia formula for a, a solid sphere. And we're going to have solid spheres being running around on our mechanical analog here, and so this particular number here, two fifths, will figure into the behavior of the mechanical analog of uh, Hall effect. In any case, in this, ca in, in this case, the uh, answer for the uh, radius, uh, this radius, plus some extra uh, height here, that's the hitting height that we talked about uh, for the uh, stick. Uh, that that's, uh, the figures into it so that R plus H comes out to 70%. So. Uh, you can go down to the pool hall now and check to see if this uh, height of the cushion is 70% of the uh, diameter of the ball. Okay. How many, uh, just out of curiosity, how many people know about this technology? Just out, have you, have you ever heard about this? Okay, nobody? I'm surprised, because it used to be this was taught in elementary physics, but uh, somehow it got lost. It isn't that we stop playing pool. We probably play it more often now than we did, but uh, it's uh, you know there it is. It's it's a it's a kind of a neat thing that you, you should know about if you claim wisdom in uh, physics of mechanical things. Okay, now gets the hard stuff. Um, what we're interested in here are Maxwell's equations, 
and so we're making um, some connection with the uh, subject that um, most students hate the most. And this was true at Caltech when Mr. Smythe was teaching uh, electromagnetism, but he did it in a very nice way. When it came time for the University of Illinois, they, they hired a guy named John David Jackson. And some of you may have been using the book by Jackson. Is that used here at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is, right? Well, you ought to really Google, Google Jackson and Hitler in Bunker. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? It's an amazing soliloquy by this actor who was uh, um, in a movie about Hitler's last days. I don't know what the name of the movie is. But in any what case, they've redone what he's saying. And he's complaining about Jackson. And you should see some words that he has used to describe his distaste for Jackson. Anyway, just one thing. Uh, in any case, we're going to be talking about uh, the mathematics that um, you need to do electromagnetism, but also uh, mechanics, in this case, uh, and mechanics of relativity. Now, before we get started here, let's just review the Maxwell's equations that we're going to use. They're very uh, uh, elementary ones that just involve the potentials. Uh, scalar potential, and with our little complex uh, toy uh, field analysis that we did uh, in uh, the end of Unit 1, Chapter 12, Actually, it's chapter 10. Um, this uh, A here, the vector potential, now we're talking about three-dimensional vector potential. Vector potential is, to me, one of the most mysterious pieces of our lore. And, and, and when we use it in gravity, it gets even more mysterious. But in electromagnetism, it's really something that you need to think about. Now, in our mechanical analog, the vector potential will be the the, tangent, the velocity at any point on the, on the surface of that rotating uh, table that, uh, that we're using for our analog. But in the meantime, uh, the forces that are, are caused by a B field, and the B field is going to be when that table gets turned on and starts rotating, uh, the uh, field that we'll be talking about will be uh, the simplest B field that you get uh, just from putting a wire uh, up and then looking at the right-hand rule, basically. But uh, here the right-hand rule that I'm referring to, and it's the one I call the FBI rule. And the idea is if you, if you uh, forget uh, which direction uh, the force will be for a given charge times velocity, but that charge times velocity could be given, that whole vector could be given the name I for current. Okay? So, uh, if I've got, if I take my hand and I use my right hand, and it's well known that FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, is a right wing of our, if it was political at all, the political system, right? And you also know that FBI agents have guns, right? So it, it, when you get to teach electromagnetism somewhere, you got to bring this up. And basically what you do is you take your right hand and you go F. B I use magic marker or something to write F B I on the tips. Okay, and then like a gun, you hold it like this, and that's what I'm, I'm drawing a picture of right here. So this is just showing if my uh, force is pointing this way, and the field B is pointing that way, then then the current has to be this way, or you know this is the current, and that's the field. This is the force this finger right here, okay? The finger that you might use if you get arrested by the FBI. We're not going to get into that, <laughs> okay? But this is a, a, a cool thing, which we'll, we'll keep in mind as we go through the algebra of this. This is the only geometry I'm giving you right away here for the scalar potential, vector potential. This is the equation uh, that we're talking about here. And the force that I'm talking about right now is just this one. V cross B times the charge. In this case, an electron charge can be imagined in all of this. Okay, so the idea is to take these equations. This is basically a Newtonian equation, mass times acceleration equal force. And here's the force given uh, in terms of 
of the um, electric field. The electric field is, is both a gradient of a scalar and a partial time derivative of the vector. That's a, that's a miracle right there, that, that's, that, that that works, that we can get away with doing a, you know, electromagnetism and all the stuff we do in solid state physics with that uh, piece of Maxwell's technology. But then it's V cross and then del cross A, so we've got a triple cross here to deal with uh, that we should do, uh, give as much uh, uh, help to as we can. And um, that is a Newtonian equation. Job here, turn it into a Lagrangian equation and a Hamiltonian equation. We've got to do that uh, before we go on uh, with our um, uh, geometry of uh, tra trajectories and things like that. So let's pause and make sure that you're familiar with a tensorial way to deal with a triple cross. Uh, I should say it's a double cross right now, not another cross. You're just, uh, that, when somebody cheats you, you say the double cross, right, sometimes. Anyway, that's what we've got here. We've got two cross products. And the way to handle that that's most efficient is to use the epsilon tensor. Now, how many people are familiar with the levi civita tensor, just out of curiosity? I have it somewhere. Else. You are? Good. Okay, so you've seen it. Everybody seen it? No? Who has not seen this? I've seen it. Okay. Well, it's worth doing. I mean, this is, this is something that helps you out, uh, makes you swear fewer times at Jackson. Okay? So, uh, let's, let's go with it. The epsilon tensor, unlike the delta tensor, uh, is 1 or minus 1 or 0. Delta tensor, you remember, with delta ij. That's the letter that comes before epsilon in the alphabet, right? The Kronecker delta, that's the mathematician's name that goes on that. Uh, it's just two indices, and it's 1 when they're equal and 0 when they're not, right? If any two of these indices are equal, it's 0. So it's kind of the opposite of the delta. Okay? Uh, so there are fewer components of this thing by far than there are of a, of a delta if you're talking about high dimensional space. We're not. We're talking about three dimensions here. So if that's the case, you can just think of all of the permutations, three factorial permutations of this uh, quantity. I start with i, j, k alphabetical, and then I, uh, I, I move actually uh, uh, two uh, objects. Uh, here I just, uh, I, I left the K alone and moved the I and the J, flip them. Here, here I left the, uh, let's see, I, let's see what I did uh, here, uh, I, J, and K. I just uh, switched the K and the I. Let's see, maybe this is actually. Uh, the second term is wrong. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. not right. Yeah, I, I just want to switch one thing. If I switch one thing, I get a minus. And the same thing here. I've got the J left along and the K and the I have been flipped. That's a minus. So if you have permuted with a permutation that involves two things, you've got a minus sign. And you can do that three ways. Or if you slide them along, start with I, J, K, and slide them all three of them this way or the other way, this is some group theory, uh, you get a 1. So these are the only cases uh, of that uh, thing uh, there out of uh, 3 factorial, which is 24 possibilities that give you a non-zero answer. The half of uh, the 12 are uh, 1 and the other half are minus 1. I'm uh, sorry, the 6. 6 of, of the possibilities of non-zero. Okay? So when it comes time to do a cross product, uh, tensorial way to write that thing, if it's uh, just the jth component that you're interested in, of del cross A, and del, we're going to write the, that streamlined way we introduced on the first lecture, a partial sub A, and then it's, it's a second rank, uh, really tensor, there's the B uh, component of, of A. Okay. So, this this guy right here has got to be uh, written as a cross product. You use epsilon A, B, J, or any cyclic permutation of those two. 
or if you want to stick a minus on it, any binary transposition uh, permutation. Three uh, three ways to do that. But right now, I'm going to always stick the uh, thing that's uh, representing what component of this, the J, J's component. I'm going to stick it at the end. Okay? I'm going to do the same uh, with this guy right here. Because the next thing I have to do is, uh, and this has got the case component of this entire thing, is I've got to take V and cross it with this guy right here that is uh, J. So I've got to do, um, well, in, uh, in this case I'm sticking the K first, but the I and the J are in that order. The I associated with this component right here, and this is uh, being summed. Now over repeated indices, there's an I and an I that's being summed over. There's a J and a J that's being summed over. There's an A and a B that's being summed over. So a lot of summing going on here from repeated indices. B and B, A and A, and then I and I and J and J. Okay. And then K is on the other side of the equation. So not something over that one. But there's something over everything else. So the uh, idea is when you do this, I want to turn this into delta functions. That's I want to go back to the simple part of the of the uh, um, Greek alphabet. So the answer to this is if you're summing this thing uh, here, that is, if, the, if that's the thing that you're dealing with, this particular one right here, K I J A B J, you replace it with this. You replace it with something that is in the same uh, order. That is, you've got the uh, A and the B here, and the K and the I. So you've got K I and you've got A B. So you you get a delta for K matching A, and you get a delta for the I matching the B. And that would be the end of if it weren't for this one. This one is just the same thing, but you switch the A and the B. So there's just these two things you got to remember uh, to solve this thing, which is looks like at first it's going to be a mess. So that, that makes it so that you turn this thing into a bunch of dot products. All, all stacked up, of course. So when I, when I put the, this guy next to this guy, I simply take this A and make it into K. K is the master here. A is just a dummy that we stuck in there. The same thing with the uh, B, but now the I has, has a sum with it. So we're going to get a dot product with that. And so, uh, so forth. This one is just the A and the B have been flipped. So this little technology uh, saves you a lot of hair pulling when it comes to doing cross products, uh, even a single cross product, certainly double cross products or worse, that this can get you out of the trouble. And it's also important because now you can treat these derivatives the way they should be treated. That is, this thing is going to act on the thing to its left, I mean to its right. So there's the answer, uh, at least as far as the tensor, tensorial. Now we're going to convert it back to uh, once we've collected all the terms, tur turn it back uh, to uh, the um, thing that it is in terms of old-fashioned, well, I should say, a, this is American notation here, you know. This is Josiah Willard Gibbs as the one that's responsible for these fat vectors and dot products and cross products. We'll explain later how that all came out of Spinner analysis, which came out of Quaternions, which is Hamilton stuff, really. But Americans got to take credit. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, they're the stupid ones that came up in Europe. They're so smart. And uh, Josiah Willard Gibbs came back from Europe and taught us this vector analysis that we have more or less love or hate. Anyway, the basic idea is, is uh, pretty obvious. We've got here a partial with respect to k. That's a gradient. That's the case component of a gradient. So the vector here is this acting on both of these. And you see I've, I've gone ahead and expanded this one. And then this one I didn't expand. It's just being left there. That's VA dot. It's a dot product over and the A part of that thing. Uh, the gradient of A is the uh, the A is the thing that gets the K is the actual vector. And that that um, that is being written out uh, here 
on, on two ways, I think, if that's right. But this one right here is this, and then finally this is that. So that's a pretty complicated thing to come out of this, and that's what we have to do in order to make this into a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian equation. So uh, this is a bit of a, of a, of a, of a roadblock to doing this uh, fancy uh, things that we're going to be doing here. Let's get it all lined up here and look at it. So going back to Gibbs' bold notation is uh, the way most people will write these equations. But if you're doing most things in GR or in the literature that's now, really we don't see bold notation uh, that much. In any case, they both work. They're both interoperable. Now, there's one thing that's uh, true here that is really important. We're going to be doing mechanics of a particle. And the R partial derivative, that is the gradient, the, if you're talking about a, a, a velocity, you have a partial, all of the partials here are with respect to coordinates, x, y, and z, uh, that is absolutely zero. So our gradient of v, it's out of here. We don't have to worry about that. You've got to get rid of that. Uh, if, if you see it anywhere, out it goes. So th that's, that's a, a, a key thing. Okay? And I'll keep it at the bottom of the screen as we go through the derivations that involve manipulating uh, this triple cross. So this is a real mess. You can see what these are. These are easy to write. This would just be a partial, uh, a, uh, whatever the vector component over here was, of the scalar potential. And this one's just a nice partial of whatever the component, again, uh, for the uh, vector potential. So. Um, those two are fine, but this, this guy right here, the, the double cross, is the one we have to watch out for. Okay, and so I make that point right here that the tensor index notation really helps you distinguish these basically three possibilities, uh, one of which expands the gradient of the product. Okay. So writing it out in tensor notation is a good exercise, and if you're doing your Jackson homework, you um, may have to I'll take advantage of this. Okay, so here we here we are. Um, this is um, the uh, thing that's left uh, when we've uh, thrown out uh, that middle part here. So I'm going to have a v dot del of a, and I'm going to have a gra grad of v dot a, but I'm not going to be doing much in the line of taking a grad of that. So basically the idea is that we're going to get two terms of that uh, indicated here, middle guy uh, left out. All right. So um, here's where it starts to make some sense, and that is uh, I can uh, make sense of a total time derivative in something mechanics you do all the time. Chain rule. Okay. And this one involves time. Okay. And just like a we did the Hamiltonian. A transformation. I keep there a partial derivative with respect to time, but the other three variables of the four-dimensional space-time are being uh, uh, done here. T dot is one, but x dot, y dot, and z dot are parts of the three components of the velocity. So the idea is that this total time derivative is the partial derivative with respect to time plus what I would call the screening derivative, the, the streaming derivative, the, the, uh, the thing that you, the, the, where the change in this is due to you going along and encountering a different values of this uh, A here. In other words, this grad A uh, is going to be uh, changing. So um, that's th what this physically or geometrically means the total time derivative that we're talking about uh, in, in this particular uh, exercise. Right here we have a partial derivative of that, so explicit A dependence depending on, on uh, what this thing is doing or who's changing the uh, vector uh, potential, that, that's a whole other story. But here it's just due to the motion as well as the mo monkey business that uh, somebody outside this experiment uh, turning up and down the uh, B field using the vector potential if you could. So we're going to rewrite this in a little bit different way here to make sense out of, the, of a, what will be a Lagrangian uh, approach 
to uh, mechanical electromagnetism. Okay. So I bring this guy down, I bring this guy down, that guy too. Okay, so I've got the good old gradient of phi there, but the rest of them are kind of mysterious in some ways, because they involve A's. A is mysterious. So uh, go ahead and turn it around a little bit here. I, I can take this guy right here. It's just minus the total time derivative. So there's a streaming derivative of uh, being absorbed. And then I can go ahead and just do a gradient of both of these. Scalar potential minus the different signs, minus the uh, vector potential dotted with a velocity. So at this point, you know, a slightly simpler uh, way to look at that, and that's the way uh, to give us, uh, ultimately here, uh, something that you can write a Lagrangian for. Okay. But here's where the Lagrangian trickery, remember when we derived Lagrange's equations just for a uh, single particle? Uh, here's the, the first trick, here's the first trick. To write uh, what was started as a simple derivative of velocity with respect to time, I mean, that's the thing that goes into a momentum, isn't it? Yes, if you put the mass on it. But uh, here, I'm, I'm making it more complicated. I'm going to write it as a time derivative of kinetic energy. Okay, that's the Lagrangian trickery, all right? Sort of um, stuck up. All right? Now, what we have to do then is do something with this side of, of the equation, where we have here a uh, and this is, uh, has come through, I put the electric charge uh, onto the A and also put the minus on, onto that. So that gives you that. Then we got this guy sticking down here. And this interesting expression here, an electric charge times the scalar potential and then V dot electric charge times the vector potential, uh, that, that's the thing that um, uh, that's where the mystery lies, right inside that. So, uh, the next step then is to take this simple time derivative right here and write it as a time derivative of a partial, a gradient, a velocity gradient, the partial with respect to q dot, remember, the coordinate dot, okay? Uh, that's going to get us a Lagrange, an expression for the kinetic part. And, and it, it, it requires two things. First of all, that the scalar potential, the thing that we used to call just capital V most of the time, that it has no velocity dependence. You probably remember us saying this when we did Lagrange's equations just for a particle, right? So that's one of the requirements in order for me to pull this off, this little Lagrange skullduggery, okay? I also demand here that this expression, okay, that that, that um, of, of this, this going right here, is in fact um, <coughs> minus e times the time derivative. Now, that <coughs> is just part of what we've already said, but okay, that's, that's going into this thing uh, very soon here, because this guy right here has to have some work done on it. Has to have the spatial derivative uh, worked out uh, for it, and that requires yet another um, uh, thing. This this next step here requires that the partial derivative with respect to r of velocity is zero. Now, why is that? It's the independence we demand of position and velocity. This is mechanics right here. We've been saying that all along, it's maybe not often enough. But that, this partial with respect to r of mv dot r is that. So therefore I can write this thing and this thing, this one involving the partial with respect to a velocity of this weird combination of scalar and vector. But this one has the same combination. I'm allowed to do that because I already had a gradient of e phi minus v a. So it just comes down there. And then I'm writing the partial derivative of r of that uh, to uh, get the, uh, what is Lagrange's equations? At this point we have a Lagrange form formalism. This is the um, target of, of what we're, we're after here. So I'm going to push all this stuff up a little bit.
just to make some room there. Uh, and there's the uh, usual symbols that we use to indicate um, the spatial derivative of the Lagrangian is equal to the time derivative of the velocity gradient. So that, that's, uh, that's getting a Lagrangian. Uh, this is the Lagrangian for a, a, a particle in an electromagnetic field. Okay. To wonder any of this is a, was discovered, but it's, it's amazing. So the Lagrangian is has a linear velocity term. In addition to the usual quadratic, that's the kinetic energy, and the potential energy is the phi times the charge. So that, that's what we're dealing with. It's a Lagrangian that satisfies very simple Lagrangian equa equations of force. So worrying about a Lagrangian being a kinetic energy minus a potential is past here. We, we, got, we get that by playing with these things in just the right order. But now, now we've got something, a vector potential, you see, that, that, that doesn't have the velocity requirement. This, we never wanted to have anything, uh, we never wanted to have any velocity driven, any velocity dependence of a scalar potential. All of that velocity dependence is in the vector potential. It can have that, and does usually. Certainly will for the stuff we'll do today. Okay, so I think that uh, is the beginning of the end of this um, thing. Now, now, uh, we, we uh, to add uh, insult to injury, uh, we're going to see if we can make a Hamilton's uh, formulation of this. All right. Okay, I didn't say this day was going to be easy. But anyway, this is what we're starting with, the Lagrangian here. And the whole idea of the first Lagrange equation, that is the definition of momentum as a gradient with velocity. And this is our Lagrangian now, this mess right here. Shows you right away as I go in there with partial derivative with respect to V, is I get good old MV out of the first term here, okay, and then uh, this is a V squared, so I take a, a <coughs> the derivative there and got two cancels the two, and I just wind up with with MV, and then I've got this uh, other stuff here that I'm going to take velocity here. Well, this one is not supposed to have any dependence on velocity, so it it drops out, but I get here a uh, E A R T. I get this guy. I get the vector potential in there, sitting on right next to velocity. This is electric charge times the vector potential. This is mass times velocity. So the idea that A has something to do with velocity, uh, that is motion, is, is very important. So remember, it was the streamlines and all of the stuff we talked about in fields. Uh, this is where you kind of see it, okay? So, um, if we don't have any vector potential, then you just get m feet. Okay, and that's pretty obvious from here. It is not there. We can forget about this. It turns out it always is there, but it just maybe doesn't uh, get felt. It, it's, it's hiding in the background very often. Okay, so, the Lagrangian here, the usual form, T minus V, uh, with an electric scalar factor, if this guy can be taken to be zero everywhere, then uh, we're back doing what we've been doing uh, in most of the mechanics we've done so far. And the, this, this canonical momentum, P equal MV, is the usual uh, uh, form, but only when this is zero. Otherwise, that's your momentum. You've got to tack this thing on there. It's really weird uh, to, to, to uh, see that. Now, the vector potential term, this thing, um, if it, th this thing, th I mean, this expression here leads uh, to a um, rather strange 
canonical, canonical is a little pope po at best. This means it's a generalized momentum that works for uh, generalized coordinates. Uh, that's it. The particle momentum, you see, the particle momentum mv is not blessed by the pope, but let's write it anyway. It's just p minus the vector potential. So you've got to subtract this, ex this, this funny kind of velocity from momentum, or funny kind of momentum, that's A times the electric charge, uh, uh, should have the same units as momentum. In order to get the particle momentum, you, you could you, you isolate it. Now we're going to uh, go ahead and put all this together and see if we can make sense uh, out of it. You, you know how we go about uh, turning uh, Lagrangians uh, into um, Hamiltonians. The uh, main thing uh, here is the Hamiltonian will be the product of velocity times momentum summed appropriately over as many dimensions as the system has minus the Lagrangian. So we're going to get in our nota in Gibbs notation velocity, that's q dot, dotted, that's the sum mu, with uh, momentum p minus the thing that we've been calling Lagrangian, we derived uh, just a few minutes ago. Okay, so uh, what what we what we'll be doing here um, is uh, taking this. Uh, I mean, basically saying uh, what I want to do is take the v dot p here. That's this guy minus the l. Okay, and this is what I get for my L, okay, is kinetic energy minus a strange thing involving a scalar and V dot A, and lo and behold, V dot A cancels out with electric charge and everything. I just get back to this. The Hamiltonian is this. Exactly. Crazy. What happened to the, the field? The vector field, that thing was going to make all of our magnetism. All I got is this electric thing. What's the deal here? Well, the deal is this is only correct numerically. Remember, I always said that when we get to this particular stage using the, the um, Langdon de Poincaré um, or <coughs> the, um, the other name for it. I'll skip slip, slip my poor memory here. Uh, the Legendre transformation. That's what we're doing here. Uh, this Legendre transformation requires that you finish it. You've got to get these velocities out of here. Well, we know what the velocities are, the particle velocities. Okay, and you see it's leaving it. It's something that's familiar, but it's, it's only correct numerically. It's not correct uh, physically or differentially. Hamilton has to be explicit in momentum. So we had to replace the V with this thing that has a minus sign in it. Okay, well, V dot V is going to be pretty complicated. It's going to be P minus A, P minus A, product. That's V dot V. Particle V dot particle V. Now I'm correct, formally and numerically. This is the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian used in high energy physics and in low energy like us down in the labs here. Okay, this is it. Now, usually you expand it out and you discover if you're talking about operators, you've got to distinguish p dot a from a dot p, but here we don't. I can get rid of that too if I want to. And then I've got this funny thing with a squared. That's kind of a, uh, what, what the electromagnetic vacuum and, uh, is going to be uh, in that thing. Then I get what I'm used to. It's just e times this uh, scalar potential. If there's any electric fields around, that's going to be there. So th there's your, your deal. This is the interaction. Your interaction is now p dot a not E dot X. Electric field dot distance, that's your uh, interaction term uh, for most people. Most people wouldn't, don't get to this when you're doing low energy physics. You just work with E dot X. And that's okay. That's what this is going to, you know, give, give you most of the time when things aren't going fast. Okay, so what are Hamilton's equations? This is where it gets, where we really need all of that technology with epsilons and things like that, uh, we'll see that coming back at us now. Okay, so uh, here is Hamilton's velocity equation. It's r dot 
is partial h with respect to p. This is the one that doesn't have the minus sign. But when I take a partial derivative of this thing with respect to p, well, I'm, this thing Carter Ray gives me a p over m. This thing right here, the two cancels, and I get an a over m. So there's your there's a funny expression for velocity. It's not just p divided by m. It's p minus the whatever that field is. Uh, and somehow the field is changing our mass. Really, it's changing that thing to a thing. So this this is just copying what we called the particle velocity relation before. Okay, so we got one Hamilton equation out of the way. We got the one, we got to get the one that has a real force in it, the P dot. Okay, now P dot, that's the second Hamilton equation, involves a minus sign. This didn't happen with Lagrangian, if you recall. Uh, P dot was partial L with respect to X, no minus sign. Why is that? Well, L already had a minus potential, so the minus sign was already there. I didn't need a minus sign if this is a Lagrangian. Okay, so just to remind you of where these signs are and how you can think of them uh, maybe efficiently. Okay. But here I need the minus sign because H is going to have our scalar potential. We're going to be dealing with stuff like that. That's the gradient of a scalar potential down there at the end, but the magnetism is giving me all this stuff. So we've got to work this out. That's weird. Okay, that's where the weirdness is. That's the electromagnetic weirdness. We were very useful, used to electric field, but now with the magnetic field, we've got to worry about this thing. And so this is going to take us some, some tensor algebra, the kind of stuff we already did. So, uh, what we're talking about here, p dot, and one of the ways to write that is, is that. But um, what I, I need to, of course, do is uh, expand out this, this guy here. Now, this guy, uh, I take the partial derivative of, of, of that um, <clears throat> with respect to x. I've got uh, a p minus a x, and then I've got a partial of the a u. The, um, Remember, uh, the derivative with respect to a coordinate of momentum is identically zero, but that thing has a, a coordinate dependence usually. If it's a constant, uh, fine, you wouldn't have anything, but it, it wouldn't be doing much because this would be zero. Okay, so um, we've got to make use of some of our relations that we already uh, had, I'd like to put back the electric field as a gradient, but I've got to put it back as a partial with respect to uh, time of A. So this partial phi with respect to X here is going to give me a time derivative of the A plus the electric field. So electric field plus the effects due to magnetism. And then this one right here, immediately uh, this thing, <clears throat> that's the particle momentum. So I immediately get the particle velocity sitting here. So we're recovering what we had before, but it still looks like a big mess. I've got a, this thing, and then I've got to work on this thing with, I can find uh, relations that I've had already. Here's the uh, total time derivative of the A. There's V dot the space derivative of A, so I can stick that in there. And I've got an E there, but I've got an A dot there. It turns out they cancel. Looks like the electric field takes a walk, okay? But I'm going to cancel the one on this side and leave that one. And that's just what the doctor ordered. You probably recognize this as V cross, the double cross, grad X, grad A. That's what that is. There's E. So this is just V cross B plus E. We're back. Bang. <laughs> FBI rule. Okay? We've come full circle now. Okay? Go through this just one more time here and put it up on this screen. I'm getting behind on these things. I don't want to do that for the stuff that's coming up. But this is, I think, really neat in the sense that at least it verifies that we can do Hamilton mechanics. We now come back for a circle. Okay. This is FBI rule. Plus electric. Electric fields in there too. 
Okay. This is this is the clearest. Uh, uh, it may not be very clear at first, but this is the clearest presentation I can think of to take care of this mechanics, the Hamiltonian mechanics of electromagnetism. And it's relativistically correct. That's the beautiful thing about, about it. Okay. We'll talk about that later on. Quantum mechanics gets weird with it. Really weird. All right. Let's do something that's pretty simple. Uh, what we'll uh, take on now is just constant E and B field mechanics. We're going to let a particle go running around, first in a magnetic field, and make the cyclotron orbits and all of that kind of stuff but also uh, have it um, experience the magnetic field. So we're going to have both this and this, and that's absolutely essential to have both of those, uh, magnetic and electric field, uh, in the um, situation uh, that occurs for Hall effects. Almost all of the uh, probing of our 2D lattices involves a cross constant B field. That's the easiest. That's what we're going to have here. But that means that the thing that's giving this, the A field, is B cross R over 2. It's a, a vortex, or it's a rigid rotor is what it is. This is, this is a, a field of a rigid rotor. Namely that table that we're going to make the analog with. This thing is going to be a rigid rotor on which a ball is rolling. Okay. And then when I turn this little crank here, I'll tip the table. First, we won't do that, but I'll turn on the electric field too and see uh, the cyclides that this thing will do when I turn on that. So those are things we, the physics that we need to get familiar with, and it involves solving the equations that involve the vector potential, the curl of the vector potential being the, the B field. Okay. And, um, well, let's do it. That um, is the uh, thing, and then we'll play with this analogy. Now, in the, in the event that the machine doesn't work, which is, uh, happens sometimes, it, I built this thing at Georgia Tech, and uh, <clears throat> rambling wreck it is, uh, the, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be gentle with it at first, so it'll work at first. But I have videos of it, so if, we, if it craps out, we'll, we'll be able to look at the videos. Okay. So here's what we're dealing with. A derivative of a velocity that involves a, curve, a cross product of that velocity with some constant field that's pointing in one direction. We're going to fix it so that the B field is out and the electric field is in the plane. So that's what we're going to uh, start with and essentially finish with. That's going to have all of these effects that we uh, like to see. So. Um, we're going to have some shorthand labeling here. Uh, the E over M ratio, a very famous ratio that um, took a lot of really good physicists to measure, uh, that uh, is going to simply uh, be absorbed uh, in a Greek E epsilon. Okay, so epsilon will be uh, have that factor, E over M, uh, embedded in the electric field. And we're going to have a, a capital B that will eliminate the, the BZ E over M. So that E over M is everywhere here, and it's going to disappear into the formalism. And Gibbs notation gives uh, the situation that we have here, that number B times the unit vector in the Z direction. So that's uh, going to be crossed with a velocity that's only in the plane. We're just going to stay in the plane for the analog, and in cyclotron resonance you usually stay in the plane. You can always have the thing drift if the B is really constant field. It doesn't matter if you have drift up and down out of the screen, but we won't talk about that. We'll just do the X and the Y uh, for the velocity. Okay. So, uh, that's this thing. And then uh, the electric field is only going to be in the X and Y in some direction. Um, in, on that particular thing, I can only tip the table this way so that it'll only be, uh, we won't have that, we'll just have that. All right, and the usual cross product uh, identity uh, for, um, is that right? Let's see, X, 
y cross z is e x and e x cross z is I think this is going to be a y. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm going to abandon Gibbs. Um, we spent some time on complex variables here. You can turn this equation into a very simple equation. It just comes down to v dot equal epsilon, where it's, epsilon's a complex number. So the x and the y are going to be real and imaginary, real and imaginary, x and y. Okay, that's my complex epsilon. My velocity, the same way, it's going to be real and imaginary v dot. I'll just call it v dot without any indices. And this thing, same thing, if I put the b uh, in there, and it has uh, a velocity that's in x and y, I'm going to have um, an i times b in order to get the right sign is this. Okay, So th th this guy right here is a y vector. That's going to have an i on it. That that's the imaginary part, and it's going to be vx multiplying it. And then uh, this other guy right here, the EX, it's just real, but it'll be multiplied by VY. Okay, is that clear? So there's the complex velocity times B with an I on it. That's one way to write it. And, and then here's the electric field, the complex electric field, real and imaginary part. So we've done these replacements here of the unit vectors X and Y with 1 and I, imaginary the square root of minus 1. Okay. Well, all the differential equations that we do, you write them pretty, pretty nicely uh, using that. That's a, a neat trick. I just wanted to have you be aware of this as a cool way. If you're, if you're doing a two-dimensional problem, very often you can write it most easily uh, using complex numbers. And then the calculus of the complex numbers is pretty simple. So what we're doing here is we're seeing that the... Um, there's going to be a velocity of this uh, thing. And what I want to do is I want to cancel the constant of, uh, E field to give a really simple equation. Okay, so uh, basically what I'm going to do is, this is sort of a boost. I want to uh, define a large V, uppercase V uh, derivative, v, v dot, okay, as our, my ordinary V dot uh, plus uh, something that, um, well, I'm, I'm trying to make this equation just be this thing. And uh, by doing that, I have to add a real part and an imaginary part, beta. Uh, and it's the derivative of that, actually, that I'll be uh, interested in. So that is what um, makes this thing go. So um, I'm going to bring all this stuff up to the, the top here. This is just with the complex numbers mostly uh, showing. This is the original Gibbs notation, but we're solving it, uh, this thing right here. And the idea is this velocity transport, I want to cancel the constant E field. So I'm, I'm just simply making uh, that thing equal to, to get rid of this. I'm, I'm going to add basically that, but scaled uh, uh, appropriate P dot. <coughs> With this thing. So the velocity that I'm talking about here, and there's the dot of the velocity, that's an acceleration, uh, has this subtracted. And the electric field is equal to that and that, so it leaves me just with IB times the velocity. So this is a pretty simple equation to solve right here. V dot equal minus IBV, or minus I times V. That is just giving us an exponential. Okay. E to the minus IBT times V0. That's the solution. All there is to it. Well, what in the heck is that? It's a clockwise, use your left hand for the minus sign, rotation. Remember how I said this is an operator that rotates? Let's use it. And that's the solution. That's your cyclotron orbit. Okay. And it's going to be left-handed for this particular uh, set of constants. Okay. And the FBI rule should verify that for you. All right. Then I can get the I can put the beta back in there. Okay. And so I'm going to have this thing plus this being rotated. Okay. The initial velocity 
plus that extra term is going to be rho to less. That, that means that I've got a velocity that's constant. This thing is going to be drifting uh, due to the electric field. Here I'm getting into the electric field sort of velocity frame and just having something going around in the left hand. And this thing is going to have it move. So it'll just be like a rotating stick, you see. Rotating stick that gave all those funny cycloids. Uh, that's what's going to come out as you uh, take this thing apart. Mm. Okay? So let's uh, go ahead and finish that. That means get uh, this kind of, of, of equation. I can, at any point, I can go out of the complex form and into the vector form. This is really what the differential equation in a matrix form involving the x and the y components looks like. Here's the rotator, that's this thing. Here's this thing written out, and of course the signs are there for the, the thing that's the real component, and there's the imaginary component with an extra, um, well, minus minus makes it a plus. Okay, and then I've got the electric field, okay, and it was minus i, so I get a minus x down and a i y up. That's an important effect right there. What's going to happen with this thing is that when I apply an electric field in the x direction, the y component is going to move. If I apply a y thing, the x component is going to move positively. If I apply an x, the uh, y component is going to move negatively. So when you put a field, uh, an electric field on something, it's not going to fall down the electric field, not, not for very long. It's going to take off in that direction or that direction, depending on which direction the magnetic field is. Okay? So you can't fall in the magnetic field if you're charged. Gravity will suck on you, but that's just going to make you move this way. That's the Hall effect. <laughs> it's kind of neat. Magnetism is mysterious in its wonderful ways. Okay? So, um, this complex coordinate is uh, a key thing uh, for this. Now, that's just the velocity. I still have to integrate. So, i got to do one more integral on this exponential here to get that, plus an integration constant. And you got to figure out what that is, because that's uh, giving your initial conditions of position. So there's the answer in a complex form. We could go ahead and move this whole thing up, which I will do now, and stick uh, that in there with the matrix form of this. I took the matrix form of this. Here's the uh, real matrix, real components, no complex uh, there anywhere. But this is what you're actually uh, talking about. Uh, each of these terms here is part of the Hall effect. Uh, solutions for an individual uh, single charge. It's got this uh, rotation. This rotation is left-handed because the minus sign is, is not there. It's down here. That means it's, it's a lefty. Okay? And uh, it's acting on that thing, which depends on the initial velocity and the electric field. Now the x and the y are in the position you'd expect it to be if the b uh, to get rid of all of the magnetic effects, uh, you're going to have this expression right here, just do the electric field. And this would be your, your initial uh, values. This is the constant. This is just a linear in time. And that's just this thing right here. Remember, when we integrate it, we get a tape. Okay, is this clear? All right. Well, we've got a few minutes to play with this. Uh, so we have simulations to play with. But the, the idea is simple. The idea is that once again, and you can check all the signs with your gun, uh, the, the, this cycloid example, we've got uh, an initial x uh, nothing and a, a velocity of nothing, uh, and then we figure out what it would do in a magnetic field. Um, the, the, there's a cyclotron orbit that's determined by uh, this, and that is uh, that is uh, what this would be doing if I didn't turn the electric field on. The electric field here is is up, 
and that's going to make the thing drift uh, as, it, as it rolls, okay, and it's going to be rolling left-handedly, okay, so it's going to be doing that, and there'll be a rim on that wheel. That's the wheel itself, the points on the wheel itself will be a, a true cycloid, the kind of cycloids we've been working with, but the rim will probably not be exactly the same as the uh, wheel. The little r will not be the same as the big r. The big r could be smaller or larger than the little r. I made it larger right here. And that would make a curloid, a curlate cycloid. Uh, if the rim is smaller, okay, uh, then I'll have a prolate cycloid. It just kind of looks like a sine curl, a wiggly thing going along. And all of them going perpendicular to the electric field. The electric field is causing this uh, a rotating thing to drift. And it's just like the flying stick. Uh, it's making all kinds of cycloids, depending on where you set the initial conditions uh, for the charge that's on undergoing all of this. So that uh, is pretty much the discussion uh, that finishes this. But at this point, um, if you have uh, access to the lecture notes, we can easily demonstrate this just using the uh, program here. And I'll do a little bit of that, but mainly I want to go uh, and finish the class by running the mechanical model, uh, hopefully. But in any case, um, it, if you uh, set this thing up and click on this right here, and I haven't used this for a while, so we'll see what it's, it's like. But here's a typical uh, charge doing a cycloid motion due to an electric field that's down. So this would, could be a gravity problem. That's what I actually gave you as a charge in a gravity uh, uh, field. And um, you can uh, uh, go and start at the same point here and maybe throw the thing uh, a little bit up and have a whole bunch of particles uh, do their thing. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, I could also uh, throw it down. I should have erased paths. Let me do that. Let me uh, start this thing over. Reset to equal zero. <coughs> I'll do it. I'll erase paths and then let it. It's I should just uh, pause, or actually reset zero and brace paths, let it go. These are the controls that let you swarm as many particles as you, as you want and set uh, initial conditions uh, any way you want. But you can see it's, it's really quite a complicated motion that you're getting. But no matter how much you throw the thing, it always converges. All of them converge at the same point. It's the harmonic oscillator uh, hiding in the um, electromagnetic Hamiltonian that we have. It's just a constant field everywhere. If the field's not constant everywhere, then of course it changes. OK, uh, let me. These are uh, other things that we do with this particular program that you can uh, play with. Uh, and we'll be covering a lot of this stuff as we go through um, the other units. But um, we even have the volcanoes of EO, and you remember all of that stuff is here. <coughs> let's show your turntable, Professor. Hurt. Yeah, let's go ahead and do the turntable. Time, time is tight. Um, the, uh, just to be uh, safe, I will get out of this right here and go forward just to, um, there's the typical thing. Again, the, the repeat very much. This guy right here is what we'll be looking at. I'm going to have to do and some cutting here. Here it is. In case it doesn't work, this is it's showing. That's what we're looking for. And the question is, how, um, how fast is that ball 
rotating. It looks like the table is rotating a heck of a lot faster. And there's a reason for that mm -hmm. that depends on the inertia of the, of the ball. That's equivalent to setting its charge, its rotational inertia. Now what you'll see, if, if, even if it's working, the, the, the thing slips a little bit. So you can't count on it, uh, this, this particular thing, uh, to work. I'm going to uh, back out of this. It's a little different uh, thing going on there. And that's what's so amazing about the internet, is that you've got uh, this stuff uh, coming up more and more. Anyway, the rest of this lecture is just deriving the motion of the ball. And this is, I do it with a very simple substitution. It's no fancy uh, things at all. But the basic idea, the bottom line of this is that the E over M, that's the ratio that determines the cyclotron frequency, is the omega of the table divided by 1 plus mass r squared, the r being that right there. And uh, for a solid ball, remember I said the inertia uh, coefficient is 2 fifths. For a hollow ball, it's 2 thirds. And if you have uh, 2 thirds here instead of 2 fifths, hollow ball will cycle a lot more. It's a higher charge. The smaller the inertia, the higher the charge of the, uh, of the analog charge of this mechanical thing. So uh, let's go try it. And you're welcome to um, stand around and in fact throw balls at it. Yeah, um, gonna... But let me go ahead and just do a slow, slow one first. Then we can try for higher speeds. But um, basically you just turn it on there, I hope, and let's see if it will go. Get around. That's fast enough probably to get, um, I'll use a yellow ball here. The idea to get it started is just put it in the center, but then kick it. the electric field it makes a very curly uh, cycloid grab the thing <clears throat> just giving it a little bit circle now when I tip the table um, down toward me you see it cycloids over uh, in this direction, if I turn the table uh, so the uh, <clears throat> electric field is that way, if I do that, it takes off in that direction. And the other thing that, that will eventually, if this thing works well, show is that a cyclotron resonance is just simply a big magnetic field is constant. They're really hard to change big magnetic fields. So the electric field is not so hard. So you just simply oscillate the electric field by doing that. Okay. And when you do that, um, if I put it in the phase, this is what we're going to be talking in the next unit for, if I put it in a plus over two uh, phase to the uh, uh, ball, I will resonate it up, and that's what you want to do in a cyclotron. You want to start thing out in the center, have it spiral out, and come out with a high velocity. That was the original particle accelerators were all that, cyclotrons, uh, at Berkeley during World War II, roughly. Uh, if, in fact, you stick the thing right here and follow the ball, turning it uh, this way, uh, you can contract the orbit, unresonate it. So those are some things you can do with this. Um, uh, I would uh, ask you uh, to, um, as I pick up the speed here, uh, think of games that we can make with this thing. I haven't been able to come up with that yet. 
but I think I have the field pretty low right now. And as I increase the speed of the table, so it still hangs on. So only after a while, though, it, it will slip. And um, ideally, if you were going to do this big time, you would use a high-quality glass table, absolutely flat. You can make really flat glass, and then a glass ball. And there's, you know, the stick, the stiction of glass on glass. If you've ever put two glasses against each other, two crystals against each other, it's, it's really high. So this thing would last for a very long time, or over a very long time, it wouldn't just, uh, decay like this one does. But, but that's the basic idea of this. So when I uh, turn the thing to slope the field, the electric field is now that way, you see it's driving over to that side. And I just turn it on very gradually so I didn't get much oscillation. Now I'll slowly turn it off. So that the table is now slanted towards me. I got a little bit of oscillation there, but it's, it's pretty good. As long as I don't, uh, if I treat it adiabatically, I, I minimize the uh, rotation. If I turn it on suddenly, though, I get big cycloid, and it'll get bigger usually when I turn it off suddenly. Turn it the other way. So now the uh, main number that comes out of this, uh, from that calculation to the bottom of the screen uh, over there, is that this thing goes around two times: one, two, for seven rotations of the table. So that's something you can check in the video, but you can do it here. If I, I'll count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That should have been two rotations, of oh, two orbits, I should say. Okay, so that's what we're getting with a solid ball. Um, I have some hollow balls here, but I should point out. Um, I guess we tip this over here. It works just as well with little guys. And you see they're in sync until it, it, it slips. And you can tell that one's slipping because it's running over little particles of dust. And each time it does that, uh, it hops a little bit. And that, that's a slip. Centrifugal force then takes effect and it slides. Otherwise, the orbit would continue. And that's what glass on glass, uh, it would last for hours, I would guess, if it was absolutely clean. That's a, the trouble is every little particle of dust um, makes a difference on this thing. Let's see if I can do the resonance stuff, because we may not, that's the next subject here, is uh, resonance. And um, I'm going to put it in that guy right there. First I'll get him orbiting. And then um, I'll try following it around. And I think I almost got it to stop there. Let me do, do it again. Oh, I, I lost it. It's, it's kind of like rubbing your head and stabbing your stomach at the same time, watching that thing. Now let me just try the cyclotron thing, which is put it in there and turn it. Now as I go, I literally swing the thing up, but it's, it's one of those things that's hard to do. I, it's hard to follow that thing because of its rotation. There we go. Now it's, I've, I've, I've missed it there a little bit. But as I go around with it, I'm literally slingshotting it. 
like a cyclotron. Okay, so that's the uh, cyclotron demonstration. The um, other thing that I don't know, just come and play with it, darn thing. I mean, it's really, it's really fun to uh, pull it. I had thought I brought in a couple of tennis balls. I think I have one in my, my coat pocket or something. But they're, they're, try it. Yeah. It, sometimes it, a sponge ball works pretty well, but you can see it's slipping a lot. You see, so that doesn't, that isn't, it doesn't so stay there too long. Sure. But just go ahead and put some ball, put a couple of balls on there and see what they do. Which one? Oh, okay, i would probably do what that one did. I'm going to see if I can find a tennis ball. Are tennis balls hollow? Yes, and that would be a different concept. Um, yeah. Oh, you got the same. Yeah. Let's Pretty get much. something on there that sets the frequency so you can see which one goes faster. <clears throat> see where we are here. It is. Did you? Something happened. Oh yeah, it's a break. There we go. Let's first of all. I haven't even tried this. I just thought of it this morning. It uh, slips. Yeah. It slips a lot. Um, but it, you can see that it's a faster rotation than a solid guy. The solids are uh, like a hollow like, racquetball or something like that. That would actually probably be better, yeah, because it has some surface. Be, yeah, and it and would stick get a lot more traction. A lot more traction, exactly. Yeah. Cyclotron, and I've got it in plus, I got to put it in minus here. Try to kill that motion by following it. And there's another particle in there, but it's out of phase. You gotta be in phase. Now, let me see if I can get that guy to stop. I got him to stop, but I couldn't get the other one to stop because he's out of phase. So you, you can only stop, you can only uh, anti-cycloid resonate one particle, unless you can control the phase. Well, go ahead and give it a try. In fact, we want to play it dangerous so we can go, we can go faster. Go ahead and do it. You start in the center and it'll and then just sort of kick it a little bit. The other thing that's interesting about this thing is the gauge transformation of the electromagnetism here towards concentration of the ball. You're putting a spin this way around the contact point. It doesn't change the contact point. Thank you. 
Square off on it on the other side, sort of send that chair and get a feel for that, for that tilting wheel. The wheel that it Direction. If you're riding in a turn, you would say that. Because by the time it actually. Okay, so this arc is in the turntable square. Yes. Okay. If you're looking in the lap frame, when we hit B, it's be somewhere else. It's possibly be like way, way in the future because it depends on. You want that? Yes. Probably fairly. Well, that's what we learned there, didn't we? Yeah, it's like goes around. It's just integral for a different sort of turntable. It's yeah. like a linear turntable to do. Basically, in the lab, it makes that spiral. So we don't care how much this exact speed we just care when it reaches the end. So what is the speed when it reaches the end of the turn? And the thing I think it's not, oh yeah, it's oh, bouncing all over the place, it's not so uh, well, you that. know, that might be an issue with the rack ball, too. And responding to the um, arm, in the case of the uh, consider the Chinese version of data, we should give all the angle momentum to the unsettled. Yeah, we actually have a rack ball mover in the We're bringing in for you as well. Yeah, we have a lot of them in the EP1 rack I never understood in this I should be flattered for cyclotron giving me a pump. I never understood it. Now I understand. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. So in ideal circumstances, it would just do this forever? Well, um you know, uh, you've got it. Well, you know, it's like you've always got, and you call it imperfections in your system. If you eliminate your imperfections, you know, it should be fine. Instead of having this sort of thing here, you know, it's got a like a regular. Yeah, you can set it up.